6 o'clock. Time to get started. Let's all take our hymn book and turn to page 268. Page 268, sing the first, second, and last verse. Page 268. in Jesus Christ. We as a church are for life and for new life, for birth and for new birth, because it is the very will of God. He is the one who gives life, and I'm thankful for the new life that I have in Jesus Christ. I hope every one of you today has made a decision in your life to place Jesus Christ the foremost of your life, because without him, we have nothing. Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you you have given each one who's placed their faith in you and you alone everlasting life. We thank you, God, for the gift of salvation. I pray, Lord, tonight that you'd help us as we look to your word to glean things from your wondrous law that we might be closer to you. Lord, I pray if there be anybody in this room who does not know Jesus Christ, their Savior, Father, you'd draw them to yourself. Bless tonight. May Jesus Christ be glorified. We pray in his name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. A couple of things. Uh, this evening, uh, men after church tonight, if you would uh, help us just about 15, 20 minutes, we need to take all uh, the uh, pulpit, the chairs down to get ready for vacation Bible school. We've got a couple panels we need to put up, and uh, we need to uh, get our stuff ready for vacation Bible school, which starts tomorrow, tomorrow night from 7 o'clock until 8.30. We have vacation Bible school for kids about four years old up to sixth grade. So if you have kids that age or know of kids that age, encourage them to come. We have some flyers in the back, but that's a free event. It's a pirate theme, so I encourage you to dress piratey as best you can. You don't have to bring a real sword. Nobody wants to die tomorrow. You don't have to bring a real gun with bullets, okay, even though we're pro-gun and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're, we don't have to bring that kind of stuff, but uh, we look forward to uh, that tomorrow night, and it's going to be good. Also, don't forget tomorrow, men, we have our breakfast breakfast fellowship at nine o'clock at the 43rd street deli also coming up this coming saturday july 2nd our barbecue fellowship will be from 10 o'clock or 10 30 and 10 30 until 1 30 we'll start 10 30 with some games some activities then about 12 o'clock uh, we'll have our eating inside so please bring your best barbecue there'll be a competition who has the best barbecue at north gainesville baptist church and uh, whoever wins gets a 50 dollars gift certificate all right, so look forward to that. Also, Toby Weaver and the Redemption Trio from West Coast Baptist College, they'll be with us July 6th. 
and he'll be preaching that night, July 18th and 22nd. Our teens are going up to the Wild Christian Camp in Brevard, North Carolina, and July 31st, communion service. So lots of things going on, busy time of the year. Brother? Second place is it? Uh, and it is nothing. Nothing. Okay. Amen. All right, let's take us home. Look, turn to page 302. Page 302. Between the first and last verse, page 302. <laughs>
fellowship. Had a good fellowship here tonight. I forgot to mention before we get, went to fellowship, Miss Juan is walking around without her assistant. If she starts to trip, somebody catch her. All right? Don't let her trip up. Also, tonight, got another special occasion. We have someone that is turning of age like tomorrow. Uh-huh. Mason, uh-huh. Is your birthday coming up? It's like soon, isn't it? And you're going to be huge. You're going to be big, big. It's going to be big. And we have another one that is... In 1957, this time, I was almost two months old. But Brother Connor is turning 22 years old. 22. So we got to sing Happy Birthday to Brother Connor and Mason. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday. books and turn to page 345 page 345 sing first and last verse oh what a friend we have in Jesus page 345 what a Jesus Christ. Brother Jimmy, would you pray for our tithes and offering tonight?
Thank you, Miss Robin. Take your Bibles, if you would, tonight and turn to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. While you're turning there, let me say I'd be remiss if I did not say I am very thankful for the overturning of Roe v. Wade this last week. For 31 years, North Gainesville Baptist Church has stood up for the innocent, the unborn, and we have stood against abortion. And I pray the day this church does not take that stand, they rot Ichabod of the front and we close its doors down. We are always for life, and especially for the life of those who have been unborn. So we do thank, are thankful for that. We know that's a federal case, and we pray that many states continue in that vein so that lives of the unborn would be saved. Amen? Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 13, and we will look at the life of Abram. Abram. The Bible says, and Abram went up out of, e out of Egypt. And he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him in the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he went on the, his journeys from south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been in the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents and the lamb was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. There was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be, be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen. We are brethren, for we be, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left, then I will go to the right. If thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plains of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. And Lot chose him all the plain of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from, one, from, from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelled in the, in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Gracious Father, we ask again that you meet with us. We thank you for the promise of your word that you are here in the midst where two or three are gathered. I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, be with us. Your presence would be sensed. God, that we thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells every believer. I pray, Lord, tonight, Lord, that we would cannot gain more of you, but you would gain more of us. That you'd help us, Lord Jesus, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, as I prayed before, that you'd save any soul in this room who does not know Christ. That you'd save that soul that's closest to hell. Bless tonight. May Jesus Christ be praised. Help us to gain some things from your word, Lord, to help us in knowing you better. In Jesus' name, amen. A certain man was rather ill-tempered. In fact, some would say he was absolutely brutal. According to a few reports, he was a weak leader in the home was unstable to hold a steady job. His wife was not well. In fact, she had, was plagued with a disease that would son, soon take her life, that of tuberculosis. Of the seven children ultimately born to her, only three lived to be an adult. At this particular time in history, the death rate among children was tragically high. Three out of every five children would die. This is exactly what happened to her, of course. She lost her first son when, she, when he was only six days old. And now, less than two years later, the disease of the press woman is discovered she was pregnant again. She was advised by everyone to abort. To abort. Why not? Why not? Because that child was precious and made in the image of God. She stubbornly refused and decidingly carried to, to deliver the child. The civilized world is grateful for her decision because the child grew to be Ludwig, Ludwig van Beethoven. What if she decided to abort? Private Joseph Lockhart and Private George Elliott were on duty on the Opana uh, radar station located in, uh, in Hawaii. They were about to go off duty when Lockhart noticed the characteristic dip of an airplane on his radar screen. He would watch as more than 50 blips appear on the screen. He called Lieutenant Tyler with his findings, but Tyler assumed that the blips represented American bombers returning from maneuvers in California. He told Lockhart to forget it. Instead of calling Major Kenneth Burquist to confirm his assumption, which was standard procedure. 
He never called the men. He went off to duty. That decision, along, of course, with many others, bad decisions, enabled the Japanese bombers to attack Pearl Harbor without warning. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Your life is equal to your decisions. You're here tonight because of decisions you've made. Some good, some bad, some poor, some wise. The greatest decision, of course, is knowing Christ as your Savior. There is no greater decision than that. Greatest decision you ever make and ever can make is knowing Christ as your Savior. But decisions really define your life. You can make one bad decision, and that can hurt you for the rest of your life. Or you can make some right decisions, like knowing Christ, coming to church, reading your Bible, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, marrying the right person, being, being around righteous people instead of wicked people. You make right decisions, it's going to help you in life. So each of us are really the summation of our decisions. Do you think about that as your day? That's why one of the most important prayers you pray every day should be, Lord, give me wisdom to make right decisions. Right decisions. Going right instead of left. You say, that, that, that serious? Yeah, that's serious. Because going right or going left could mean the difference between life and death. <laughs> How many people have not come to church when they should have been in church, were out doing something they shouldn't be doing with things, with people they shouldn't be doing with, and got themselves in trouble? Mm, maybe happening as we speak. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote prophetically that every man will one day be seated at the banquet table of consequences. Consequences. Let's recap a little bit about Abram's journey. First of all, we see Abram's faith. God gave a command in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, but to land that I will show thee. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thee thy name great. That will be a blessing. We've seen that. Talked about that last time and time before last, how God had specifically called Abraham, Abram at this time. He had not changed his name yet to Abraham, but Abram, he'd be the father of many nations. God was going to bless him. He came from a pagan place called the Ur of Chaldees. Not only did God give him a command, Abram, by faith, then chose to obey that command and go towards the promised land. The Bible says in verse 4, in chapter 12 of Genesis, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot with him, and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the substance they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, went forth to go into the land, and to the land of Canaan they came. So then Abram arrives in the promised land, she reassured by God, and pitches the tent towards Ai, the pile of rubbish, we talked about that. And Bethel, the house of God, he was in between. He was in between. The Bible says in chapter 12, verse 7, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, where thou bid an altar of the Lord, who appeared unto him, and re removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on his west and Ai on his east. And there he built an altar of the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. There he was. And then, as we talked about last week, what happened? Famine struck. Pandemic struck. Trouble come. Trouble come. We see not only Abram's faith, we see Abram's folly. Chapter 12, verse 10, there was a famine in the land. What does Abram do? Instead of having faith to trust in God and stay where he was supposed to be, remember, he was in the promised land. He was where God wanted him to be. He was exactly where God wanted him to be. Dear friend, when trouble comes, don't leave where God wants you to be. Don't leave where God wants you to be. Stay. You say, I'm not sure what to do. Wait. We talked about that. that when you don't know what to do, the best thing to do is don't do anything. Wait on God. Listen to him. Pray. Seek his face. Seek wise counsel. There's wisdom, the Bible says, in a multitude of counselors. I see, I see so many people, even Christians, even church people, make unwise decisions without talking to the first preacher, without for, talking to the first educated, uh, well-to-do, if he sense, in, in the Christian realm, person. I see them just making bad decisions and not, and not even thinking about the consequences. 
I was like, man, before you make, if you, if you made, if you wanted to sell your house, you'd consult somebody, right? Dear friend, if especially about a spiritual matter, wouldn't you think you'd consult somebody about that? Man, before you make, before you move, you, you, you going from place A to place B, man, make it, talk about that stuff. Talk to your preacher. Talk to somebody. Don't just jump off and go. I've seen people who are church folks go to a place, and the first question I ask them, where are you going to go to church? I mean, folks, if you don't have a church to go to, why would you go? You going to start a church? Well, I'm going to look. I've known people who've left a church where they were members of a church and 15, 20 years later, they're still looking for a church. Well, dear friend, I don't know about you. I couldn't go many Sundays without going to church. Unless I'm sick, unless I'm going out, you know, on a boat somewhere, you know, on vacation or something, ain't long. I, I'm going to be wanting to look for a church. If you're going to make any move, especially physically, the first question you better find out is not how much money I'm going to make at that job. The first question you ought to be making, men, is, is there a good, solid church where I can go to worship God with my family? Don't make, your, don't make that the second decision. Make that the first decision. I mean, I, you know what? I have people calling me that have been to church here many years ago. Say, I used to go to North Gainesville Baptist Church. Can you find me a church in so-and-so? I did that for a guy just a couple weeks ago. Man, I'm happy to. That's about like calling me and saying, hey, can you find me some good barbecue? Yes, I can. <laughs> you, want, you want to know where a good restaurant is? Just ask a preacher. He's going to find it. <laughs> I'm going to know where all of them are at sooner or later, brother, because that's where I'm going to be. Amen. Abram flees to Egypt when he should have stayed faithful to God. You think, you say, God, if, if he said, preacher, if, uh, if Abram would have stayed where he wanted, do you think God would take care of him? He took care of him in Egypt. Don't you think he took care of him in, in, in the Canaan land? Man, you don't have to go to Egypt, friend. Because we talked about last year, last week, that Egypt always talk, is always referred to as like the world. You don't have to go to the world for answers. You don't have to go to the world for help. Get your help from God. Allow him to provide something for you. You see, moms and dads, if we don't teach our kids one thing, we've got to teach them that God can provide. God can provide. We always say, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and you open to it. If we keep going to the world to get our stuff, is God relevant at all? Why go to God when you can go to Google? Why go to God when you go to Walmart? Maybe God was to buy, provide for something to you for free. You ever had that happen? I've been thinking about getting something for a long time. I haven't even talked to my wife about it. Today, somebody came to me and said, I got a free one. You want it? I said, um, yes, I do. <laughs> Didn't cost me a dime. Could God, could God do that? He's Jehovah Jireh, friend. He wants to provide for you. Seek his face. Be patient. But you know what? Amazon's awful convenient, isn't he? <laughs> He's right there on the screen. Just press him. He'll be here tomorrow. With a smile. Now, the box might be at the neighbor's house, but that's a different sermon. <laughs> Thirdly, Abram tells his wife to lie to, to lie to save their lives. It was a half lie. Same father, different mother. Verse 13, chapter 12. Say, I pray thou art my sister, that be well with thee for thy sake, that my soul may live because of thee. What I say last week, once you start doing wrong, you go down a path, pathway of compromise, and you have to continue doing wrong. Once you leave God's will, dear friend, the temptation is to continue doing things out of God's will. Ain't no doubt in my mind there's some people I know the night should be in church. What, what, what happens the next day? Hey, where were you at? Um, 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 I was working. Sure you were. Oh, I, I was doing this. I was doing that. I was, uh, dear friend, just be where God wants you to be. The safest place in the world is to be in the center of God's will. Be in the center of God's will. Then you, have, then you, you don't have to worry about where I'm at or who I lied to or who I didn't tell or, who, or making up some new one. No, dear friend, you don't want to start all that. Tell the truth. Be honest. I'd rather somebody come to me and say, Preacher, I'm not going to be in church from tonight for X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And I say, well, God bless you, man. I wish you were here, but I understand. Then somebody that I find out the next day, who somebody who said to me, yeah, I'm going to be in church, didn't, wasn't in church and actually doing something they shouldn't be doing. 
different than being the will of God. The princes of Pharaoh then take Sarah anyway, but handsomely rewards Abram. Just in chapter 12, verse 15, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her, commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and he entreated Abram well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and, and she asses and camels. So not only is he out of the will of God, now he has to, set, he has to lie about his, who his wife is, Sarah, and thirdly, he gets a whole bunch of stuff that's ultimately going to hurt him. And who's he have with him? He has someone by the, ne- by the name of Lot, who's just a young man who's enamored by the world. You see, Lot can leave the world, but the world's not going to leave what Lot. That's why decisions you make have consequences. You might not see those consequences right now. You might think, well, you know, I did that and nobody knows. Oh, dear friend, somebody knows. His name is God. So you can, you can go into the world and get down in there and act just like any other heathen. But, but, but dear friend, even when you leave it, you got to be careful before long. You want to go back to the world. And that was Lot's problem. He left it, but the world didn't leave him. But God, in his mercy, saves Abram and his family from the world, from Pharaoh. Chapter 12, verse 20, Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now, that was last week. But secondly, tonight, the time we have, we're looking at, secondly, Abram's renewed faith in God. Thankfully, Abram learned a little bit of his lesson, and he left the world. And we ended the message last week by talking about the importance of If you're in the world, leave the world. Because you know what? Stay in the world. The longer you stay there, the worse it's going to get. Some of you have been there. I know some of you. Some of you went down the world, and you're still fighting off the smell. You're still fighting. You're trying to heal those wounds, those scars of those years, days, months, weeks, times from the world. Because, dear friend, once you you go into the world, hey, it's like, it's, it, it just, it wants to permeate everything about you. Oh, man, I wish I never listened to a song in the 80s. I go into the store, it's an 80s song. I know it. I don't want to know it. I don't remember, the, I don't remember those, li- those, those lyrics, but I can quote those lyrics better than I can quote the Bible. How is that, how is that true? Some of you know, you can, qu- you can quote them 50s, 60s, and 70s songs. You say Ten Commandments. Um, um, thou shalt not kill. I, okay, thou shalt not. You stumble all over it. But I tell you, the first four or five uh, notes of a song, you can sing it just like that. That's the power of music. That's the power of music. We see the marks of the spiritual man. First of all, there was separation. Abram went out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with with him. True biblical separation is not isolation. Do you hear what I said? True biblical separation is not isolation. Where I'm just going to stay away from all those bad people. Well, how are you going to do that? Because you actually got to tell them about Jesus. You're not not supposed to be a hermit. You're not supposed to go out there and find you an island out there off the coast of Florida and say, well, I'm just going to live there. I'm just going to, you know, I'm not, I'm just going to be out there and nobody's going to bother me and I'm not going to bother anybody. No, no, no. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus was was a friend of sinners, but of course he didn't sin. He was perfect. He still still told them about his father's love. See, we still have a ministry. We're in the world. We're not supposed to be of this world. We're not supposed to be fleshly like this world. We're We're not to act and behave like we used to be. We're not to go back into our old sin. We're not to go to our own old haunts. We gotta be careful about even our relationships because I got some friendships. And you know what? Before long, all we're talking about is the old days. Now, you, you go down that old days long, before long, you might be doing those things you used to do in the old days. you got to be careful about those things. We need to be separate, not iso- isolated. We need to be insulated. Insulated. Insulated by knowing the word of God, by living in this world as a believer without being of this world. When a man by the name of Archimedes said he can move the world were he given a long enough lever and a point far enough out in space as a fulcrum, just so the believer can lift the world, but can lift the world, but only if he remains separate from it. A man cannot lift a barrel by standing inside of it. No, dear friend, you have to be outside of it. The second mark of a spiritual man is not only separation, it's sanctification. It's sanctification. What is that? That's spiritual growth. 
and went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, into the place where he had, his tent had been from the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Sanctification is not much separation from, it is separated to. You say, preacher, what am I, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't do that. Well, praise God, you don't do. But what do you do? What do you do? You say, what do I do? Do you read your Bible and pray every day? Do you witness? Do you choose to, to love other people? Do you have a prayer list? What do you do for Jesus Christ? Some people are so caught up in what they don't do that they can hardly do anything because they're focused on what they don't do. Oh, dear friends, there's lots of things in life we shouldn't do. We have a Bible full of things we shouldn't do. But, what are, but don't be overcome with evil. Overcome evil with good. Why not be so busy doing good you can't do evil? That's why it's very important for every person, every person, no matter your age, no matter young or old, you need to stay busy doing something, doing something for God. You see, the old saying is true, idle hands is the devil workshop. I've seen so many people, so many people get to a point in life where they're not doing stuff. They get idle. They start watching too much stuff, looking at too much stuff, get busy bodies, talking about too much stuff they shouldn't be talking about. And get themselves in just spiritual decay and trouble. Oh, dear friend, stay busy doing something for God. There's lots of things to do. You say, preacher, I don't know what to do. Well, I tell you what, come to me after church. I'll give you a list. Man, there's things to do. There's all kinds of things to do. The second mark is, is sanctification. Some people live, try to live as close as the world, as close as wickedness as possible. If I'm driving my motorcycle, Harley Davidson, down this road, down this road, <laughs> or any road that has, you know, potholes or ditches. I'm not trying to get as close as that thing as I possibly can. I'm actually trying to get as far as I, as way as I can. But dear friend, if you say, well, I just, I just skim the edge of it. I'll get close to it. No, you skim the edge of it, you get close to it. Next thing you know, you'll be falling in. And you'll be like that old commercial, I fall and I can't get up. No, dear friend, stay away. You see a pothole, get in the other lane. Well, check your left first so you don't die by hitting that guy beside you. And then, as I learned in motorcycle class, Brother Brian, and then after I check my left, because knowing somebody's in that lane, then turn over to go to the left and get away from it. Stay away from trouble. Don't skirt with trouble. Don't play with trouble. You play with fire, dear friend, you will get burned. It is, a, it is no doubt in my mind. Stay away from it. This is what sanctification is all about. It's not trying to get as close to the world as possible without losing one's testimony. It's keeping as far as away from, from wickedness as possible and getting closer to Christ. He was choosing to be separated. He was choosing to be sanctified. And thirdly, a mark of a spiritual person is he came to sacrifice. The tent symboled Abram's attitude towards the world. He was a pilgrim and a stranger. He would, he would not put his roots down here. He said, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. He was willing to go where God wants him to go. He was willing to be what God wanted him to be. He was willing to be totally yielded to the will of God. Do you live that way? Do you live to the, to the degree now, right now in your spiritual life that if God was to call you and ask you to do something, you just go and do it? Well, obviously, you want to seek wise counsel. Remember, we talked about that. You want to pray about it. You want to seek his face. But once you understand it, you believe it's God's will, you've sought his face, you've sought wise counsel, would you be willing to go? How did a youth pastor come to me one time after he made some decision in his life? He said, preacher, young preacher, he said, whatever you do, don't ever say never. Don't ever say I'll never leave such and such a place. Because what if God calls you in the middle of the night and tells you to go somewhere? You're going to be disobedient to God? You see, friend, this, is, this, my, this life is not my life. I'm not, I'm not in charge of me. I've been bought with a price. I've been bought with a price. It says, the Bible says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. If God tells me to go, the worst thing I could do was to stay. But if God tells me to stay, the worst thing I could do is to go. Are you, are, you, are you willing to sacrifice and be willing to do whatever he wants to do? The tent symbolized Abram's attitude. His altar symbolized attitude towards not this this world, but the next world. He was ready for any sacrifice he would offer of anything demanded him by God. So we see, first of all, Abraham's renewed faith, the marks of a spiritual man. But second of all, second of all this evening, the mind of a spiritual man. Verses 5 through, through 9. 
we see his worrying circumstances. Because now he's got a bunch of stuff because he went down to Egypt, he had trouble. One trouble leads after another trouble. Trials try our life. So what does he have? He has Lot with a bunch of herdsmen and cattle. And they're quarreling with, with Abram's herdsmen and cattle. And he doesn't, he doesn't know what to do. So what does he do? The first thing he does is what I've been telling you. He waits on God. He doesn't make a decision. Now, he's the head of a thing. As soon as the quarrel comes, he could have said, well, I tell you what, let's just, you go that way, you do this. No, he waited to see what to do. Dear friends, r- fools rush in. Best thing to do, again, when you don't know what to do or trouble comes, is to wait. Pray about it. We talk about this often, especially when it comes to work. Man, you get a new job, you jump in there, you say things you don't like. You don't just jump off that job next day or next week or the next week. Take some time. Pray about it. In every position, in every place I've ever gone to, and I've lived in Wisconsin, about froze to death. I've lived in West Virginia. Can you believe it? I've lived in South Carolina, where I'm from, Nebraska, and Tennessee. In every place I've gone, there's places, there's things that I liked and disliked. But dear friend, if you always focus on the dislike, you won't be where God wants you to be. God called me to Northland Baptist Bible College in 1981. That's frozen tundra up there. It started snowing. It started snowing. Can you believe it? In October, man, I was I, I, I was about to die. I'm a Southern boy. I don't like that cold weather. But instead of focusing on the bad, I started counting my blessings. Well, I get to see a whole lot of deer. Oh, man, I get to use a snowmobile. Oh, I get to eat ice cream. Oh, I get to, I don't have to worry about a lot of things, being hot all the time. (laughs) No, you count your blessings. Just because circumstances aren't what you like, it doesn't mean it's where God wants you to be. So he waited. Things weren't going well. His herdsmen, Lot's herdsmen. Secondly, not only that, he recognized that he had wicked neighbors. The Bible says there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle, the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanites and Perizzites dwelt in the land. He was having strife with his brother's son, and not only was he having strife, he was in the land of the Canaanites, and the enemies were watching him. See, that's when the worst thing we can do as a church among Christian folks is we don't get along in the world sees it. I'll never forget, and I may have said it before, I'll probably say it again. I was a youth pastor there in Bonita Springs, Florida. I saw the paper one day, and the First Baptist Church of Estero, Florida, not more than five minutes up the road, there was a picture of the preacher and the deacons outside the church fighting with one another. I said, wow, our devil is getting a heyday today. This is the First Baptist Church of Estero, and out there, out there, and the paper has a picture of it on the lawn. I wonder how that affected people. I guarantee you, it's probably affecting people even today. Dear friends, that's why you have to forgive one another. Amen? That's why you have to love one another. Get right with one another. When them small little squabbles happen, I mean, they can be like small, like you sat in my seat, that's my seat. Or you parked in my place, not my my place. Or you didn't pick my barbecue, Pastor Moon. You picked somebody else's barbecue, Pastor Moon. Or the roof is red instead of blue. The wall is brown instead of gold. The air conditioning is running instead of not running. You say people leave church over that? They have. The carpet is tweed instead of one color. You say people that spiritual immature? Brother and sister, they are. People are that fleshly and that carnal and that wicked that they would leave a church over the color of a wall. Dear friend, it's different if it was purple. (laughs) But it ain't purple. It's just a different shade of brown. Amen. Be careful about that stuff. But people get upset about silly things. Well, you know you do it. You squabble in your home. Your wife gets the gets the the scepter of power, she changes from the football Florida Gator for just five seconds to watch her soap opera, I mean, her favorite show. And you get all in a tizzy because you didn't see the guy scoring a touchdown. And you're going to be arguing about that thing all night long, over five seconds. Man, get yourself a DVR and save your marriage. Or get a different CV, something. 
Man, and the world sees it. Don't you think your neighbors over across the way hear you in there hollering and screaming at one another, yelling at your kids, hearing your kids squall like they've been beaten over there? Don't you think? And you come out there smiling, Jesus loves me, this I know. No, you don't sing that. You've been hollering and screaming like you're trying to kill each other in there. And you want to sing, Jesus loves me? <laughs> oh, be a friend. What's the Bible say? Do all things without murmuring and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Dear friend, the world is just looking for something, especially right now. Especially right now. Because the bulls have been poked. Oh, Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all Christians done overturned Roe v. Wade. No, I didn't do any of that. That was before me, and it's happened <laughs> in spite of me. Well, we prayed for it for sure. But dear friend, that be both now. Oh, it's Christians' fault. No, no, dear friend, this is, this is <laughs> it. Ain't us. It ain't us, man. Dear friend, realize the devil. He wants people to get upset. He's looking to anger of the folks out there. He's wanting the people to get upset, get mad, live. With, by the grace of God, with grace and mercy and kindness and forgiveness. And we see the weaker brethren, he was waiting on God. We had weaker neighbors. He was, he was looking at his weaker, weaker brethren. He dealt with Lot with spiritual directness. Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between, between me and thee. He, he didn't want any argument, argument. He wanted to seek peace. And that's what God wants us to do. The Bible says, seek peace and pursue it. As much as lie within you, dwell in peace with others. Dwell in peace. Please be a friend. We're we're to love one another, but you might not like everybody. Okay? You might not like everybody. Well, if you don't like them, okay, you might not like them, but live peaceably with them. Be cordial. Dear friends, if we're, if we're to love our enemies, at least we ought to try to like and, and love our Christians, right? Amen. Amen. He dealt, he dealt with them with spiritual directness. He dealt with spiritual discernment. Let there be no strife, for we be brethren. <laughs> we're related to one another. Dear friends, we're related to one another. We all have the same blood, physically and spiritually. Everyone in this room are children of Adam and Eve. Everyone in this room are sons and daughters of Noah. We all have one blood physically, and if you know Christ, spiritually, we're all one blood. We're all, we all one family. Ought not be no squabbling, ought not be any arguing, ought not be no fussing, complaining about stuff. If you have a, something to disagree about it, dear friend, don't go to five or six other people. Go to that person, to them alone. That's what the Bible says. And if you want more information about that and how to get forgiveness, I can give you so many books about having forgiveness and getting forgiveness that it'll make you call you to go to sleep. But dear friend, there's, there's so much out there about being forgiveness and getting forgiveness and being forgiven. He, he, Abraham had spiritual discernment. He could have just been mean. He could have been angry. No, you go your way. I'm going my way. I'm doing my thing. You do your thing. But he didn't do that kind of thing. Two Christian ladies have been had shared the same office. One always wore the window up, one always wearing it closed. One said, I feel, I feel I'm going to suffocate in here. The other said, I'm going to catch my death. Someone came up with a suggestion, why don't you keep the window closed until one of you dies of suffocation and keep it open until the one dies of pneumonia? <laughs> you both get your way. <laughs> we smile at this story, but how true it is. We let so simple of stuff part us and hurt us. But dear friend, we be brethren. The Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. What you would, would not do to yourself, don't do that to another brother or sister. If we as Christians would only act like Christians, this world would be different. But we're so busy acting like the pagans that the world looks at us and says, who are you actually like? That's the truth. Dear friends, in essential unity, the Bible, Jesus Christ, the church, we need to be unified about key doctrines of the church. But there's a lot of things that goes on in church and even in a person's life that are non-essentials. And those things we ought to show liberty. In all things, though, we ought to have charity and love. My home, I run a little bit different from your home. And you run things different from your neighbor's home or that person's. There's liberty. There's liberty. And just because you 
you cook food one way, somebody cooks it different, or you like maybe something a little different that's not wicked or wrong, dear friend, show a little liberty, show a little compassion. Then he treated Lot with spiritual dignity. My dear, he's basically saying, my brother, choose, you choose. I'm not going to choose, though he was the oldest he could have chosen. He said, you choose. I'll take what's left. What spirit of sacrifice? He put away his own rights as the oldest person, the person who could have made the choice and taken the best of the land. He didn't do it. He let Lot do it. Well, that's Christianity right there. That's preferring other people before you. Dear friends, that's, that's, not, just, that's not just preaching. That ought to be our life. That ought to be our life. You know, that's just like being a gentleman. Man, when you walk into the door and a lady's behind you, don't just walk in the door. Hold the door for the lady to walk in. Now, ladies, when the man holds the door for you, be a lady and say thank you. That's just common stuff. That's just common stuff. But common stuff's not being practiced anymore. I'm not, that's not even, I'm not, I'm even talking about Christianity. I'm just talking about common stuff, you know. Be polite. Be courteous. Be kind. That's just being human, much less being Christian. Sunday morning, or Saturday morning, it's coming. Who's going to be in the line first to get the barbecue? Now, we do have to eat. We can't all look at you go first, no, 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 you go first. But, dear friend, it is something about, you know, being careful. Be careful. You don't want to be known as the first person in line to eat every time we have a fellowship at North Gainesville Baptist Church. Be careful. Be careful. Spurgeon said, it takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. It takes more grace than I can tell to tell you to play the second fiddle well. You don't have to be first. Show humility. Thirdly, we see the moves of a spiritual man. He was restrained by God. Three things that mark Lot's choice. First of all, we, Lot was weak in his devotions. The flocks, the herds, the tents, all that he got, <laughs> all the stuff. Like I told, talked about this morning, it's, wrong, it's not wrong to have stuff, but it is wrong when stuff has you. The stuff had Lot. Egypt had gotten into Lot. He liked things. And I'm sure it wasn't just Lot. I'm sure Lot's wife had something to say about it too. Remember Lot's wife? He was weak in his devotions. He was weak with spending time with God. His relationship with God was not the same as Abraham's relationship with God. And that's why it's so important for us to realize that, you know, friend, I can't make Christianity. My Christianity can't be, my daughter, my son cannot have the same Christianity that I have. They must have a relationship with Christ on their own. Nobody can live off the coattails of another person. Yes, they can follow others. Even Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But ultimately, every person must have their relationship with Christ. What did Lot need? He needed to know the God of Abraham like Abraham knew his God. He needed to worship at an altar. He needed to, be, he needed to know God. He needed to have a right relationship and follow him and worship him just like he saw Abraham do. But instead of doing that, he could have said, no, Abraham, Uncle Abraham, I tell you what, thank you for letting me have the first, first pick, but won't you go ahead? He didn't do that. <laughs> no, he didn't, have, he, didn't have, he didn't have a good relationship with God. Secondly, as we mentioned, he had worldly desires. This is a good place to raise children. He didn't ask. Was it a good place to raise children? Oh, it has a Starbucks. I got to go there. Oh, it's got a Target. It's got a Coles. Oh, it has a Cheesecake Factory. We got to go there. It's got a Best Buy. Man, it's got a fishing store. Oh, man, it's got all the nice places, all the neat places. It even has a massage parlor. Man, look at all these places we can go. Man, it looks great. Won't we just go there? Is there any spiritual influence at all inside? Of oh, no, but why are you looking about that? Mm, no bad decision. Bad decision. He was weak in his devotions. He was, he was worldly in his desires. And a person who's weak in their devotions and worldly in his desires will inevitably be wrong in his decisions. Weak faith, worldly, decide, worldly desires equal wrong decisions. Every time. Every time. The Bible says, them, but the men of Sodom were wicked 
and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. What did, what did Lot do? He chose foolishly. He chose foolishly. Now back to Abraham just for a minute. The man was restrained of God. Saintly old George Mueller used to say that stops as well as steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I say it again. Stops as well as steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He was reassured by God. Lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. Verses 14 and 15. For the land which thou, hast see, thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. God reassured him, the place that you're at, Abraham, it's, where God, it's exactly where you want it. You ever go to God and say, Lord, show me your way. Give me direction. You see, God wants you to be where, you want to, where he wants you at more than you want to be where you're at. I'll say that again. God wants you to be where you should be at more than you want to be where you're at. He really wants you to be in the center of his will. So if you're not sure you're doing what he wants you to do, why not ask him? God, show me thy way. Lead me, guide me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Show me thy way. Give me something from your word this morning. Lead me in the paths of righteousness. Dear friend, if you have that type of spirit, you have that type of desire, don't you think God, your Father, wants to show you? Don't you think the Spirit of God wants to lead you and give you direction? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He wants to lead you. You see, Abraham's not lost a thing by living in the will of God. So many people say, well, if I live for God, he's going to take every way for me, and I'm not going to have anything. No, dear friend, you're not going to lose anything. You're going to gain. You're going to gain. I read it this morning, but from a, different, from a different gospel. I read from Mark. I read from Matthew. Everyone that had forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands, for my sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. What did I give up when I became a Christian? Oh, some friends, some habits, some hobbies. But what did I gain? I gained a family. I gained friends. I gained fellowship. I gained fruit. Dear friend, I can't explain to you this evening. All I've gained was because I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Oh, how wonderful it is. Oh, how wonderful it is. Man. Abraham didn't lose anything by doing right. He only got more. Oh, dear friend, your life as you trust in Christ will only get better and better and better as you seek his will. The Bible says Abraham was reassured of his posterity, not only his possessions. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Not only did Abraham gain, his descendants were going to gain. His family that he didn't even see were going to be blessed. And you know what? They're still being blessed. And they will be blessed forevermore because they are his chosen people. Oh, they've gone through persecutions and problems and difficulties and trials. They've been, they've been, <laughs> they've been lied about, talked about, enslaved, killed. But yet, God still loves them and has promises for their specific people. They're not even for us, for them. And dear friend, the same is with true with us. You're going through trials and difficulties and hardships and, and pains and sorrows. Oh, man, difficulties. This other day, this other yesterday, I was praying with Mrs. Shaw in the hospital. She had all these issues, all, died, actually died. The, the hospital had to bring her back to life. Put a pacemaker home, in her. She got home not long after that. She was walking, fell, and broke her foot. Brother Shaw, I said, but you visit North, North Florida a whole lot. North Florida Hospital a whole lot. She's going through some trials, going through the difficulties. You said, preacher, why do they go through some? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a sermon in itself. But ultimately, may he use it, trials and problems in our, all our lives, for our good and for his glory. And at the end of it all, not one of us, if we're honest, could say, God cheated me. No, dear friend, God's blessed me beyond what I can even imagine. Past what I can even understand. And what he has in store for me is past what we can even talk about this morning, this evening. Oh, dear friend, how wonderful it is. 
Reading the book of Romans changed the life of Martin Luther. Reading Luther's pre preface on the commentary of Romans transformed the life of John Wesley. Attending a chapel in the primitive Methodist, one of the groups following the teachings of John Wesley, led to the conversion of C.H. Spurgeon. Spurgeon touched the life of, of young Henry Morehouse, who turned transformed the life of D.L. Moody. Attending one of Moody's meetings transformed the life of C.T. Studd and six others who became known as the Cambridge Seven. Each life touches another life. That's why your decisions you make for righteousness or unrighteousness matter. Every decision you make in this life matters. Matters. It matters. Now, I'm not talking about whether you have pork or chicken down at Sunday's tonight. But I'm talking about serious decisions you make in life. Am I going to read my Bible today or not? Am I going to watch something maybe I shouldn't watch or listen to something I shouldn't listen to or, or, or hang around a certain person? Those type of decisions. The more serious the decision, the more time you ought to spend in prayer. The more you ought to seek his word, the more you ought to look and ask God for counsel. Thirdly, he was regulated by God. Finally, Abram was regulated by God. Arise and walk to the land, for I will give it unto thee. What he promised he was going to do, he was going to do. And different in our life, what he's promised, he's going to do. He's working out all things in our life that we can't understand it, that we can't grasp. But we know the word. We know the words from the scriptures. But dear friend, those who love God and are called to his purpose, everything is working out just the way God wants them to work out in our life. The question is, will we trust? We receive promises like Abraham promised, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he's preparing for us a place in heaven. But we, yes, we go through trials. Yes, we go through difficulties. Yes, there's pain. Yes, there's times of waiting. But in the midst of it all, God is still good. God is still good. Abraham, yes, he went down to the land of Egypt, but by the grace of God, he came back out. You see, friend, let me say to you as we close, your failures don't have to be final. Your failures don't have to be fine. You say, man, I messed up my life. Who in this room who, who's honest with God, who hasn't messed up in life? Who hasn't, who hasn't, as I say often, who didn't zig instead of zagging? Or zag instead of zigging? Who didn't go right when they should have went left? Who didn't turn around when they, when they should have went forward? We've all done that. We've all done that. The Bible says a just man falls seven times rising up again. I heard the story, and I'll close. Thomas Edison, you know, inventor of the light bulb, he had the light bulb finished. He gave it to one of his trustworthy assistants. He said, here is the light bulb. He was supposed to take it from A to B. He was carrying the light bulb in his hands, and he dropped it. And it shattered into a million pieces. Well, he didn't just go pick up nothing off the shelf and say, here you go. No, he had to go make another light bulb. He made another light bulb. And you know what he did? He gave it to the same assistant. He gave it to the same assistant. And this time, the assistant got it right. He said, preacher, I've fallen down. I've made mistakes in my life. Dear friend, to fail, fall down is human. We all fall down. It's not how many times you fall down. It's how many times you get back up. Maybe you just need to get back up. You need to get back up. Go down to the world, made some bad decisions, did some things you shouldn't have done, made some unwise choices, didn't seek wisdom, didn't seek counsel, kind of went out and did it on your own. You thought you, you thought you was Sinatra, I'll do it my way. You found out that was the wrong way. Doing it your way was always hard. Going your way is always wrong. Go God's way. And maybe the biggest lesson Abraham learned that God saved him out of the world and now he needed to trust it trust god more well, we're going to look abraham's got some more issues he's going to struggle some more but at the end abraham is called the friend of god oh that you and i would have that title of us you are i am a friend of god oh gracious father thank you for tonight thank you for your mercy thank you lord for us looking at this true life story of Abraham, who was your friend.
Oh, God, I pray you'd help us to learn some lessons from his life, God. There's so many lessons we can learn, so many things we talked about tonight. With head bowed, eyes closed, I wonder tonight, if, do you know Christ is your Savior? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. But <laughs> thankfully, though we were sinners because of, because of what Adam did so many years ago, we inherited that sin nature because of what Adam did so many years ago. Thankfully, Christ died on the cross. God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ came. He, he died on that old rugged cross. He shed his blood. He was buried and he rose again. We believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the be- death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You say, friend, I don't know if I was die today, I'd go to heaven. Oh, dear friend, as I mentioned this morning, you don't have to, you, it's not about being religious. It's not about coming to church. It's about having a relationship with Christ. Do you know tonight, if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? Is there any doubt in your mind? You say, preacher, there's a doubt in my mind. I'm not sure, but I want to be sure. With head bowed, eyes closed, someone say, preacher, I want to go to heaven. I'm not sure about it, but I want to be sure. Would you pray for me, anybody at all tonight? I'm not sure if I were to die today, I'd go to heaven, but I want to be sure. I won't embarrass you, but I'd love to pray for you. Anybody at all tonight? Anybody at all? Preacher, I've made some mistakes in my life. Who hasn't? I don't want to stay in the world. I don't want to keep making bad decisions. I want to live for God. I want to do right things. I want to live for Jesus. Oh, yes, I've made some mistakes. And God has showed me in his mercy. He showed me my mistakes. He showed me my faults. He showed me my failures. But I don't want to stay there. I want to do right. I really, by the grace of God, want to do right. That's my prayer tonight. Would you pray for me that I would do it? Anybody be honest tonight? I struggle. I'm struggling. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm struggling. Whatever it may be, the Holy Spirit tonight is speaking to you. In that still, small voice, he's whispering to you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to, he's trying to steer you from going the wrong way. Oh, dear friend, choose to listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit and do right. As the music plays, let's stand to our feet. If you're here tonight, God's speaking to you. Speaking to you. You need to make the right choice. Don't stay in Egypt. Don't keep doing the same things over and over and over again. That's insanity. No. Don't keep making the right, wrong, bad choice. Oh, dear dear Lord, I don't want to keep going down this way. I don't want to keep making these bad decisions. I don't want to have this type of reputation. I want to live for God. I can't do it on my own. I need his help. Is that you tonight? You're crying out for help. Oh, dear friend, cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. Cast it on him. He's calling to you tonight. He's giving you an opportunity. Two quick announcements before you leave. Quick announcements, brother Nate.